Welcome everyone to this uh, Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition High Level Dialogue. We are very pleased to have you join us today. My name is Elizabeth Mealy. I am the Communications Manager for Sustainable Development at the World Bank. Today, we're focusing on how to realize the full potential carbon of carbon pricing in a sustainable recovery. Today's discussion is part of Kickstarting a Sustainable Recovery, the Climate Group's Sustainable Recovery Series here at the World Bank. We're doing this in partnership with Innovate for Climate. During the conversation today, please feel free to use the Twitter hashtag sustainable recovery. And if you have any questions or comments, please share them in the chat box. Just to let you know that this session today is being recorded and it will be available for replay. Now I'm very pleased to welcome Mari Pangestu, who's the Managing Director of Development, Policy and Partnerships at the World Bank. She will give opening remarks. Thank you, Mari. Mari, you're, you're on mute currently. Thank you. Yes, this is always the challenge. We forget to unmute ourselves. Uh, Mr. Tao Xiang, Deputy MD, IMF. Uh, Mr. Angel Guria, Secretary General of OECD, Minister Juan Carlos Sorbe, Minister of Energy of Chile, distinguished uh, partners of CPLC, the Secretariat team, uh, ladies and gentlemen. A good day and uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, I know that we were all supposed to meet at the spring meetings uh, and therefore I would like to thank all of you for joining us today, uh, even if it's virtually for the CPLC high level dialogue. And I'd also like to thank the Coalition of Finance Ministers for Climate Action for also collaborating to hold today's dialogue. I've been asked to make uh, opening remarks and kick off the dialogue today. And I would like to just share four points uh, in that regard. Uh, firstly, is the opportunity for change. Uh, I think if you uh, see what we have been trying to do uh, for the last few months, uh, as we responded to COVID, we, we went to the emergency uh, health and economic uh, phase, and now uh, we are into the so dealing with the economic and social impact relief stage, and also uh, looking at the opportunities to help uh, countries become more resilient. And this, you know, big notion of um, building back better. And here is where I think uh, we have the opportunity as we are dealing with countries in uh, uh, designing their uh, plan of recovery, this will include reforms and policies toward a low carbon development path, uh, where we think that growth, sustainability, and inclusiveness do not have to be trade-offs. So I think there's this opportunity that we need to uh, take advantage of. Secondly, consistent with the call made by this group, we see that carbon pricing in combination with other coordinate policies, so not on its own, will be a key element in making the stimulus packages for recovery more efficient and lay the foundations for a green and blue sustainable economy. Currently, there are 16, 60 carbon pricing initiatives active or scheduled for implementation. And in 2019, these initiatives raised $45 billion in revenues for environment and broader development projects, but obviously much more can be done. Uh, there is already consensus that putting a price on carbon can be a key instrument in ensuring economies are more resilient to future climate risk. But we also know that the effectiveness of carbon pricing works, works best if it is part of an integrated and coordinated policy package. Ideally, it should be uh, part of a comprehensive low carbon development national plan and this is where we have seen uh, or try to find opportunities of working with countries uh, to develop such schemes, which would uh, such plans, which would include uh, energy reforms, uh, reforms in agriculture and land use and transportation and so on. Another benefit that should be uh, emphasized is that in the aftermath, aftermath of COVID-19, fiscal ref revenues are down. So carbon taxes can also be a, a source of revenue to fund health and social uh, programs. And of course, carbon pricing can incentivize and boost innovations and lead to public and private investments for low carbon options and development pathways. Thirdly, other than the reforms that we just, uh, I, ju I just mentioned, complementary policies will also be needed to address concerns 
for economic growth, jobs, and co competitiveness arising from the carbon tax. And uh, we need to have policies that address the cost and potential regressive impact to those whose livelihoods are tied to a carbon economy. And the private sector also needs to be play, playing a role in terms of programs that will allow transition uh, and uh, working with governments to help affected workers and communities. Uh, and fourthly, international cooperation and sharing best practices are critical to achieve cost efficiencies in tackling climate action. That is why platforms such as the CPLC and the Coalition of Finance Ministers for Climate Action represented here today are vital. These platforms foster partnerships and cooperation. So let me close by thanking those of you here with us today and really look forward to our continued partnership and cooperation. For our part, the bank remains strongly committed to supporting our clients to build back better and achieve the reduction of poverty and shared pro prosperity. And we believe that carbon uh, pricing policies is one of the key instruments, but again, they should be part of a coordinated uh, program by the government, hopefully one that is related to a, an overall comprehensive low carbon development path, and to make sure that the regressive impact of any of these policies uh, uh, are, are also addressed. In the next five years, we will support 10 new countries to put in place carbon pricing programs and provide technical assistance to a further 20 countries. We look forward to working with you, uh, all of you, uh, in the coming months and period. Thank you very much, and I'm look, looking very much forward uh, to uh, the results of your dialogue today. Thank you so much, Mari, and thanks so much for joining us. We now have three high-level commenters, very distinguished people who've joined us today to respond. Uh, we have Tao Zhang, Deputy Managing Director of the IMF, Angel Guria, Secretary General of OECD, Juan Carlos Jobe, who's the Minister of Energy for Chile. So let me please welcome Tao Zhang. And I'm sorry, I will, I'll, this is a three minute uh, intervention and I will, in the interest of time, be fairly strict with, uh, with time. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evenings, uh, everybody. Um, happy uh, Monday. Um, I'm very delighted uh, to join all of you uh, here uh, to support the work of the Carbon Pricing uh, Leadership uh, Coalitions. Um, as all we know, uh, the CPRC uh, provides an excellent uh, platform for uh, discussing carbon neutral transition strategies and for sharing ex uh, experiences and uh, perspectives uh, across the, a broad uh, range of countries. Uh, industries and stakeholders. Um, this, of course, including us, the, uh, the IMF. Um, the IMF um, has long advocated measures to support climate change at, uh, adaptations and uh, mitigations. This, uh, of course, includes the use of uh, carbon pricing, uh, and we have developed uh, practical tools to help our member countries uh, put into uh, practice. Today's uh, economic crisis um, has only strengthened the urgencies of uh, discussing the issues of these carbon pricing. As uh, economic recoveries uh, get underway, a great deal of investment will be taking place across the world. Having the right energy prices reflecting supply and environmental costs will be critical to allocating uh, new investment efficiently uh, across green and uh, brown sectors. Furthermore, revenues from carbon pricing can support uh, sustainable fiscal positions and help uh, find uh, social assistance and public uh, investment for the recovery. Of course, at the same time, we have to acknowledge that uh, carbon pricing is often difficult uh, politically not least because of higher energy prices. Um, in this respect, today's uh, low uh, oil prices may provide um, an opportunity uh, to enhance uh, public uh, support. Um, another aspect, close consultations with stakeholders uh, can 
and effective um, uh, uh, communications uh, will uh, continue uh, to be uh, needed. And pricing uh, can be phased in uh, gradually and in a predictable ways um, as economies recover. Moreover, assistance packages can be tailored to vulnerable groups uh, like coal mining uh, communities and uh, rural uh, households. Finally, pricing can be comp uh, complemented uh, with other instrument uh, um, uh, to improve overall uh, environmental effectiveness uh, while limiting the impact uh, energy prices, as also highlighted by uh, um, uh, Maria uh, Pankazu um, a moment ago. So um, still, um, even that, we still um, uh, need to be candid about the enormous challenges ahead. From the uh, 2017 the CPLC report, we know that measures uh, equivalent to a global carbon price uh, at least $75 per ton in 2030 are needed to meet uh, climate uh, stabilization goals. And um, right now, the world is at only $2 per ton on average. So clearly, more needs to be done. One possibility, uh, as we proposed in our fiscal uh, monitor, um, which published last October, uh, is to uh, complement the Paris uh, commitment uh, with a carbon uh, price floor arrangement. Uh, among the um, uh, major uh, stakeholders. So let me uh, uh, close by emphasizing that acting now is uh, imperative. There are some who uh, will argue that policymakers are just too busy with the pandemic and the recovery, um, um, you know, the uh, uh, going on uh, to think about the. Um, um, uh, they, we, we leave, leave a little time to think about climate change, but uh, in our view, uh, this is precisely the moment uh, to integrate the uh, climate issues into uh, policy making. If there is one lesson this pandemic uh, has taught us, it is don't mess with Mother Nature's. Thank you. Thank you, Tao Zhang. Now let me introduce Angel Guria, Secretary General OECD. Over to you. Reminding us about our single most important intergenerational responsibility, and that is to protect our planet. The OECD has been working hard to help countries navigate the pandemic and to sow the policy seeds needed to build back better. Uh, this is a key objective of our COVID-19 policy hub, which contains already over 100 policy briefs, as well as a country policy tracker and extensive data about the decisions that countries have been taking. Oh, um, it's, it's also uh, a, a central theme of our ministerial roundtables, our government briefings, um, which are, are leading to our uh, ministerial council meeting in October. Uh, now, uh, let me uh, say carbon pricing, including fuel and carbon taxes, emissions trading schemes, although I have to say I don't trust emission trading schemes because we try them again and again and again and again, they come up with seven and, and 13 and they come up with very low numbers you know some of them have been working but basically uh it, it just you know i always say uh, uh, put a big fat tax on carbon um this is my scientific conclusion uh and of course we know what the numbers are uh but the problems are not necessarily uh, uh, at this stage uh, are not happening, you know. Uh, this brings us uh, to, you know, a question of how, how are we doing? Well, we're doing very poorly. We're doing very badly. We're not doing our homework. We're not focusing. The last thing we can do is forget about this intergenerational responsibility I was talking about because of the COVID, you know, these, these, uh, we have to fight both wars. 
at the same time. Our data tells us that uh, across 44 OECD and G20 countries, 70% of CO2 emissions from energy are not subject to any tax. 70% of CO2 emissions from energy use are not subject to any tax. This includes both carbon taxes and the excise taxes on fuels. Now, uh, you, you, you were mentioning about 60 different uh, carbon pricing initiatives, uh, Mari. Well, obviously, you know, there are a lot of initiatives apparently, but it's not happening. It's simply not happening. And additionally, only 10% of the emissions in these 44 countries when they have a price, you know, when they're taxed, have a price of at least 30 euros per ton of CO2, which is the estimated minimum social cost of carbon. So, you know, in, in 2020, we should know better. This process didn't start right now. Actually, it was Nick Stern who warned us about this. Um, and that's a long time ago, or at least, that's how it feels. Um, it is simply not enough to reach the Paris Agreement targets. We need, uh, you know, we need to 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 go beyond. We need to uh, perhaps uh, double that price. But of course, first you got to get everybody to do it because uh, uh, only a few countries are taxing by more than 30, uh, 30 uh, euros. So. Uh, we know that when implemented correctly, carbon pricing can work. We recently looked at the impact of the uh, European Union carbon market and of the French carbon tax. Well, they have induced uh, uh, reductions in carbon emissions uh, and they do not negatively impact the employment uh, of affected uh, businesses. So this is why I am very worried to see lapses in the efforts to phase out fossil fuel support. Now, fossil fuel support is continuing to rise. Recent OECD analysis shows that total support for the production and use of fossil fuels rose by 10% in 2019. We were feeling good because it ended a five year downward trend in uh, 44 of these OECD and G20 countries. So it was going in the right direction and then it reverted and now it's bound to increase further. Worse, there's been a 38% rise in support for the production of fossil fuels. Now, not for the use, but for the production of fossil fuels. So, you know, what we're trying so hard to do with one hand, we are doing it in spades with the other. You know, we're, we're undoing it. We're just, it's just like a total contradiction. Uh, we, are, uh, we are fighting ourselves in a way, you know. Uh, this is deplorable and it is certainly not going to help us get our economies back on track. We need to seize the opportunities presented by low oil prices and face out this support once and for all, as was suggested. Now, the lack of public support for carbon taxes has been the biggest obstacle to their introduction and increase. This is why we need to carefully explain the rationale for carbon pricing and focus on building public support. Now, let me- 30 seconds, uh, Mr. Gurria. Yep, yeah, let me uh, finish by saying climate action and post COVID recovery efforts must go hand in hand. We cannot hope to build back better if we do not ensure that our efforts are rooted on sustainability and the protection of our planet. Carbon pricing is an important element of our toolkit to build economic and social resilience and push for an effective green recovery. The OECD is fully committed to working with you and for you to promote effective carbon pricing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gurria. Now let me welcome Juan Carlos Jove, Minister of Energy of Chile. Over to you, Minister. Thank you, Mary. Uh, 
Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. I hope you're taking care of yourselves and your health. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to be part of this meeting. Um, since it's my first time co-chairing a meeting of the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition, I would like to thank the World Bank uh, for the opportunity. We are, as we know, in the midst of crucial times for climate action, uh, with essential decisions ahead to foster cooperation among parties to reach the required by science greenhouse gas emissions levels by mid-century. Science, we have said, is not negotiable. And science has been very clear. We have no choice. We must reach carbon neutrality by 2050, even earlier, if possible. If we are serious about this goal, as we should be, carbon markets must play a substantial role. In Glasgow, the international community has the definitive opportunity to take the decisions required to ensure concrete, long-term cooperative action to fight climate change. To do this, leaders and government officials from all over the world will have, once again, the unique opportunity to agree on a system that fosters the unprecedented cooperation we require the rules of Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. We need these rules in place because, as we all know, carbon markets could balance the burden of efforts among parties and help us reach carbon neutrality with the most efficient allocation of resources. Without the international cooperation carbon markets would foster, I'm afraid we will not succeed in this tremendous challenge. The rules we need to agree on must be robust to secure the environmental integrity of the entire system and to ensure that we are all reducing our emissions accordingly. All our actions must be bounded by such rules. Given that cooperation and cost effectiveness are the main elements in this equation, carbon pricing must be the backbone of every jurisdiction's carbon neutrality strategy. Communicating its strengths and co-benefits is key for success, as Angel Gurria just said. Sharing best practices and innovative solutions is likewise indispensable. The Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition has proven to be an essential and extremely useful initiative in that context, advocating and shaping the discourse on pricing carbon encouraging the participation of governments and private sector and promoting concrete actions on the ground. The knowledge sharing between governments, companies and civil society is a unique feature of the CPLC and in my view, one of its distinctive strengths. The power of acting together that this coalition promotes must also be part of the solution to tackle a new stressor that abruptly came into the scene. COVID-19. According to the OECD, this pandemic has triggered the most severe economic recession in nearly a century, causing enormous damage to people's health, jobs, and well-being. If we make the right economic choices, this is an opportunity to build our economies back better. Fortunately, a number of jurisdictions have already announced ambitious recovery plans where sustainability, clean energy, and climate change are at the core. In Chile, for example, we are accelerating the phase out of our coal power plants and replacing them with renewables. Our 5% GDP stimulus package includes public investment plans with emphasis in green infrastructure, and we're pushing for a strong development of green hydrogen to clean our energy uses and to export green energy to the world international carbon markets will be essential to attract the investment and technology required to accelerate the introduction of new technologies like green hydrogen. In the months ahead, as we reflect on economic recovery, carbon pricing needs to be an essential part of the conversation. Exploring efficient ways of engagement, for instance, through public-private tax forces, task forces for the sustainable recovery of our regions, could help us recover better and push ahead an essential part of the climate change agenda. To 
Chilean Ministry of Energy is committed to working with the CPLC team and all the partners to advance the work of the coalition so that we can together push for harmonized efforts across the world to expedite climate action that is ambition, ambitious and undertaken with integrity. I believe that the momentum generated so far puts us on a promising path for the future, despite challenging times we are now facing. I look forward for a great discussion today and for a close collaboration this year. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister. And let me thank all of our speakers this morning in our opening session. We are now moving into more of a discussion. So let me please hand over to moderate the next session to Bernice Van Bronckhorst, who is our Global Director for Climate Change at the World Bank. Over to you, Bernice. Thank you, Elizabeth. And, and thanks. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating today. Um, it's a real pleasure to see so many faces, even though virtually. Um, instead of uh, at our spring meetings as originally planned. So, so we heard from Murray and from uh, a number of other speakers already how um, obviously the COVID response um, and, and, and recovery uh, phase presents an opportunity for, for climate change. But also, of course, um, you know, we heard from, uh, from Dr. Guria how it also really is imperative that we embed climate in uh, in this uh, in the you know in this uh, response it really remains a critical challenge so for the next half hour we are going to hear leadership perspectives on how carbon pricing uh, can really be an essential tool to help shape this sustainable recovery and in particular how we can make um, the recovery inclusive um, there is a wealth of expertise to help countries and businesses ensure that they implement carbon pricing um, that they, um, but that they also really think about and address the needs of the communities that will be affected. So let me turn now to the panel and, um, and ask them to reflect on how we use carbon pricing to catalyze the recovery process that is socially fair, uh, just and sustainable as well. So um, these are really key questions that we're also grappling with at the World Bank as we're rolling out our own um, response uh, to the COVID pandemic. Um, I'm going to ask all of these speakers to uh, keep your answers to three minutes uh, in length at most so that we possibly can take some questions from our live audience. I'm not sure that we will because we are already running over time, but uh, please keep your, uh, keep your questions short. Um, I am going to uh, first start and welcome back um, the Honorable Minister Juan Carlos from, from Chile. And uh, Minister, thank you very much for sharing your high level perspective on carbon pricing. Um, as we now know, renewable energy today makes up uh, about 21% of total capacity in Chile. And the country was ranked first in the region for investment in renewables. So could you share with us a little bit on how carbon pricing um, is playing a role in your policy mix? And in particular, how you're looking at ensuring a just transition for workers and communities? Well, thank you, Bernice, uh, um, and, and good morning, good evening, or good afternoon to the, the rest of the panel. Um, I think this is a very challenging, very challenging time. Uh, I think the, the overlap of the climate change challenge and the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, it's, it's, it's very, very challenging, but at, at the same time, it opens uh, several opportunities if, if we do things well. Uh, in Chile, we implemented our carbon tax or green tax in, in 2014, uh, and we uh, adjusted it and improved it la uh, last year in, in our government. I think the, the first thing that is important is that in, in 2014, we had a socialist government uh, in office. Now we are a center-right coalition, uh, and we supported the, the legislation that the, the previous government passed. We fine-tuned it. Uh, I think the first lesson here is that we need continuity in the policy. Uh, the efforts we need to, to make to, to fight climate change uh, require a long-term vision and sustainability. So, so this is the first thing. It is a political uh, point I'm making, but we need, as I always say, the, the measures we need to, over, uh, to overtake require stamina. We need to sustain the efforts over time. So political continuity and fine-tuning the, the tools over time 
uh, without starting all over again every time, it's, it, I think it's very important. Uh, the, the carbon tax is in, in Chile is it's giving the right incentives and sending the, the right signals to, to the private sector, as it should be. So I think it has helped us uh, push forward the agenda to, to phase out coal. Uh, in the last years, almost 40% of our electricity was generated with coal, uh, which we have to import. It's, it's, it's dirty uh, for local communities, so we're phasing out coal. We're building an enormous amount of renewable uh, capacity. Uh, five years ago, our forecast said that we were going to reach 70% renewables by 2050. We are now updating that forecast, and only five years later, our focus is that we will reach 70% by 2030. So that's 20 years before. Uh, and that is a combination of, of, the, of the carbon tax that is given an incentive, the stability of the rules in our country, uh, the enormous uh, renewable capacity we have, but also I would say a very broad consensus uh, behind the 2050 carbon neutrality goal. Uh, this is also very important. Uh, the commitment of private companies is essential. Uh, since they are closing their, their coal plants, they are building the renewable capacity. And we're making very important efforts to try to face out coal with dialogue with local communities. This is very important. They don't want to live with the pollution that, that those plants generate, but they also need the jobs. They need to rethink how those cities that are usually relatively small and where the, the, the plants play an important role in, in offering jobs and so on. So in dialogue with the communities, how do we have them retrain uh, to have a smooth transition out of coal? Uh, and we are also trying to foster uh, new industries like green hydrogen to offer uh, a way forward to foster investment, to bring in technology, uh, to, to, to make people understand that I think this is very important, that the fight against climate change is not an agenda that contradicts economic growth. We can have a completely harmonious agenda between fighting climate change and bringing in innovation, uh, investment, and fostering the development of new job opportunities for men. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister. Um, next, I uh, will invite Nigel Topping, who's the UK Special Envoy in Climate Action for uh, COP26. So, so, Nigel, as someone who's tasked with keeping the momentum going on climate action, you really face a unique challenge with the global landscape today. So, perhaps you can share with us your thoughts on how to not only keep it going, the momentum, but really to accelerate action, given the postponement of COP26 and, of course, um, all the other headwinds that we're facing today. Well, thank, thank you, you Nigel. Um, thank you, Benice. And I, I, I have to say my um, general reading of the situation at the moment is that, if anything, this is a moment when we're seeing action on climate change is accelerating. And part of that is because COVID, uh, the pandemic has both revealed our fragility and our ability to move very fast when we decide to. Um, but of course, it's also put, put health and respiratory health at the forefront um, of, of our minds and of leaders' minds in all sectors and across all levels of government. Um, and when we launched the um, Race to Zero um, with thousands of businesses and cities and investors and universities and all sorts of people committing to net zero a couple of weeks ago, um, Maria Nera from the World Health Organization reminded us that 7 million people a year are dying as a result of air pollution. So I think we, don't, we shouldn't just think of this as net zero emissions, but of um, getting rid of the dirty air that is killing our children. Um, so that's one reason why I think we're seeing an acceleration. The, when it comes to carbon pricing, the other reason, you know, business is calling for it. Thousands of businesses who disclose to CDP every year asking for it. FICA can speak more eloquently than me about that. You may have seen just this week the CEO of BP, an oil company, um, whose business will be forced to change because of high carbon pricing, was calling for a pricing even higher than the one Angel was talking about earlier, for $100 a tonne by 2030. I mean, I think what really people are calling for now that we know we have to make this transition exactly as the minister was saying is, is just clarity, clarity and consistency of policy. Tell us when we're going to phase out coal, make the carbon price predictable, not maybe as Angel says a tax, but even if it's a trading scheme, let's have a floor price. You know, in the UK, since the government 
committed to phasing out coal and put a floor price on emissions. Um, the original plan was to phase out coal in 2025. We've now run for three months with no coal. And even if we go back to the energy production levels um, that we had pre-COVID, we're running at about 2%. So coal's basically phased out in the country that launched the Industrial Revolution on the back of burning coal. I, I think that the, the, the other thing that, um, you know, COVID and other um, things are really highlighting right now is the need for us to pay attention much more to the inequalities that are um, that actually causes of societal and economic weakness in some of our societies. And so I think things like the way California has hypothecated um, some of its revenue um, from carbon pricing to some for investing in renewables and some for investing in, in fuel poor or energy poor communities is quite smart. I mean, I, th I think the other thing we all know is that now is a time when treasuries around the world are going to be looking for revenue neutral or revenue positive um, COVID response measures. So getting rid of fossil fuel subsidies, which of course is a negative carbon price and generating revenue by raising carbon prices um, seems to me would be really good. I guess my final remark would be really a plea to um, leaders on the CPLC now. Um, I remember when we launched CPLC, was it five or six years ago? Um, I think maybe it's time to start putting a leadership criteria on CPLC in terms of the level of pricing. As Angela said, we can't go on kidding ourselves that schemes with a price of $2 a ton are making any difference at all. It's only when the prices get to be on 20 or 30 and have a consistent trajectory upwards that they really drive the change. So maybe it's time to create a membership criteria for CPLC that within three years of joining, you must have a price of $20 and rising, um, or you're not in a leadership coalition. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. I think we can all agree on uh, on the need for uh, for better prices. So um, um, let me now turn to Feike. Feike Seibisma, who is the uh, the chair and CEO of the Climate Leaders Group of the West. He's also only chair of the board of DSM. And of course, he really does not need any introduction here at the CPLC, um, being one of our, our founding uh, members and, and grandfathers, I would say. Um, so, not only is Feike a carbon pricing and climate champion in the industry, but he's actually also currently tasked um, by the government of the Netherlands as special envoy for uh, addressing the COVID crisis. So, Feike, we would love to hear your perspective on how governments and central banks can help finance a green recovery. And what do you see uh, is the role of carbon pricing in this mix? Um, also thinking of the impact that COVID will have on competitiveness more generally. So over to you, Feike. Thank you very much, uh, Bernice, and thank you all for um, joining this uh, CPLC event. Um, the COVID crisis, we didn't see it coming. We didn't see it coming even when it was coming. And we thought it was Asian, now plus Italy, now plus Europe, now plus the United States and Latin America and Africa. And we, uh, we're very slow in recognizing it and, and for sure not predicting it. And I feel sometimes there is a desire to go back to an Asian po point in history, January 2020, when everything was perfect, so-called perfect, and to go back to the Great Restart. As we discussed with Prince of Wales and in the World Economic Forum, we should not get the Great Restart. We should get the Great Reset. And whilst addressing the crisis, also addressing inequality, also addressing sustainability, also addressing the climate, uh, addressing circularity. And I think that carbon pricing could be an excellent tool uh, to get that great reset. Because what you do with carbon pricing is anchoring, doing well for the world into our own economic system. And that always works the best. Now, what do we need to do? We need to broaden more countries, like Angel was also saying, more countries need to have a price on carbon, broadening it. We need to deepen it because $2 per ton is even with the private sector themselves is saying is not impactful. The private sector said below 30, it has zero impact on my operations. And Joe Stiglitz and Nick Stern uh, already indicated it should at least be a 30 to 50, moving later on to a 7,500 uh, price uh, to be meaningful. So broadening it, deepening it, making it more effective, 
And of course, there is a taxation system and there's a cap and trade system. We need to align our systems more that we can have a global market here. The private sector even wants that. Um, now, why is it not happening? And Nick Stern and myself discussed last year with governments, why is it not happening? Well, it's important, but we might lose jobs. We might lose our competitiveness. Uh, we should not move alone. So we started this commission last year of investigating, is that a fair comment? And we said, that comment about losing competitiveness, losing jobs when you implement a price on carbon is only in a few rare occasions and a few rare countries uh, true. And the majority is not, a, for the majority, this is not applicable. So competitiveness or losing jobs is not an argument. Even the opposite, the countries which are not addressing climate change uh, can suffer economically and jobs uh, tremendously. So I think uh, the private sector is even asking governments to address this. And I think we should use this COVID period uh, to do that also. And I think taxation systems, um, abandoning subsidies, uh, adding the agriculture, it's now attempted. Why? It should be added. I mean, all those stimulus uh, could be there by governments, uh, together with uh, transparency like the TCFD is asking. And those kind of policies are desperately needed uh, by industries set by governments with full collaboration that would really create the Great Reset. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Fekke, and thanks um, for your insights. I think we're going to have a, a little bit more focus also on, on private sector on the next panel where that uh, Osbeta client from the IFC will be, will be chairing. Um, I am going to invite Gauri Singh. Gauri is the Deputy Director General of the International Renewable Energy Agency. Um, and Gauri, we've seen a boom in renewable energy globally with record low prices. But at the same time, we're also seeing uh, the oil prices have crashed and uh, largely due to COVID containment measures, um, governments are also facing an economic recession. So, so what is your outlook for investments in renewables and how can carbon pricing support uh, clean energy transition? Thank you. Thank you, Bernice, for inviting me for this discussion today. And uh, um, the global pandemic and the economic crisis that it has triggered has pretty much given us a trailer of what the climate crisis could be. And, uh, you know, when we were getting into this lockdown in March, amongst all the gloom and doom predictions, what has really surprised me is, is the way governments have got the act together and they've done it in double time. So uh, I, I think the health crisis has kind of given the world, uh, um, uh, allowed us to hit a pause button and to reimagine the future. Um, I, I guess all of us know that renewables has been growing, they've been growing very rapidly and currently with a share of 26 percent uh, um, in the power sector. In uh, 2019, we saw an increase of uh, 200 gigawatts of uh, additional power capacity. And you know, we, we had a recent uh, cost report from IRENA, which showed that new capacity that's being added uh, in renewable power in 2019 was uh, costed less than the cheapest new capacity in thermal plants. So if I put it in perspective, what this means is that um, if we were to retire, uh, say, 500 gigawatts of the least competitive thermal uh, plants, existing thermal plants, and replace them with the uh, solar PV and wind, we might actually end up by saving uh, nearly $12 billion in the cost of power. Solar photovoltaics, as you know, the cost has come down by 80% since 2010, and wind in the same duration has come down by 40%. Uh, and and I, I remember in 2010, uh, I was uh, in the Ministry uh, of uh, Energy, Renewable Energy in India, and we were you know, getting our results from the first uh, uh, solar auction of uh, 1,000 megawatts. The price that really excited us was 20 cents per unit. 
which was much below what the uh, what the regulator had said and now in a recently concluded uh, auction it's down to 3.6 cents a unit but you know maybe i'm sounding to gango we still have i i guess we still have a lot to do in renewables where the shares uh, in heating cooling and transport are lagging and these are sectors that contribute uh, 80% of the total final energy consumption investments in renewables have also been kind of flattish which are currently you know around 300 billion dollars fossil fuel subsidies as we know are 400 billion dollars which are double what government spend on renewable power so yes i i do think that uh, uh, government revenues from carbon prices could be a potential funding to support renewables and if these renewable if these uh, revenues could incentivize end use sectors like buildings transport could if they could uh, in, uh, could uh, build the modern infrastructure which which is needed the flexible grids that are needed for integrating higher share of renewables and creating the infrastructure for electric vehicle charging i think it all all would really make sense thank you great thank you thank you so much gaudi um i'm going to now hand it over to uh, to nicholas stern of course nick i don't think you need any introduction to uh, to any of the audience here today um you've obviously spoken uh, previously about how carbon pricing can provide a much needed revenue stream for government so could you tell us a little bit more about the benefits of using carbon pricing instruments as a means for governments to finance public investments? Um, and in particular, how they can serve disadvantaged population groups by recycling these resources and by targeting them uh, more carefully. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Bernice. And it's, it's uh, very good to see so many friends uh, on this call. It reminded me a little bit that we're talking amongst ourselves as leaders and uh, it's also very good to talk to people who don't agree with us. Um, but what we're doing is marshalling our arguments here and uh, seeing how we can take them out. First on revenue, it, just do a little bit of mental arithmetic. Suppose we took uh, a number towards the lower end of the range that Joe Stiglitz and I suggested for 2020. So take $50 a tonne. Take uh, at least 40 billion tonnes of CO2 that we emit as a world. So multiply $50 uh, by 40 billion, and that's 2 trillion, well over 2% of world GDP. So if we did do it properly, if we did, then the revenues would be very large. Even if we covered the half of it, that would be $1 trillion a year. So there are serious revenues if we do it uh, well. So the question, what do we do with these revenues, is a very serious one. Now. The first call on those revenues, in my view, is um, to help overcome the opposition to carbon prices, because that is the key problem at the moment. Two ways that uh, are central. One is transfers to poorer groups, and there's plenty there to cover the any loss that the poorer groups might face in terms of increases in prices. And the second, is to manage the dislocation associated with the move away um, from fossil fuel production and usage, the so-called just transition. So I would prioritize those two areas because the most important thing is to get it in place. Once it is in place, then we can have a longer discussion of what to do with the revenue and potentially there's tremendous potential. So that would be my priority. Running forward into that discussion, you can imagine um, things like uh, R&D and so on, um, uh, looking after the capital markets, at least with first loss offsets, so that people uh, feel more confident about investment. But first and foremost, get it in place, use, plan to use the revenues, articulate ahead of time, that you're going to use the revenues to compensate those who might be hit uh, the hardest so that they're more than compensated and look after the dislocation which will take place. I was also given a second question, Bernice, which is what goes along with... Nick, I'm, I'm, I think we're running out of time, so I'm going to 
Talk let to me, you on answering me, the second question. Let me close on one thing then. It's going to be uh, uh, a little while before we can get the carbon prices in place. And we're in a hurry. So one thing that we have become clear to us in these last months is that the investments from the sustainability agenda, whether it's from retrofitting to planting trees and so much more, those investments are fast in implementation, labor intensive with strong economic multipliers. Keynes would have loved it and it had been right. And the sustainability agenda is something that allows us to move fast as we put in place the carbon prices of fundamental importance. So thank you very much to you all. Thank you, Nick. And, and yes, that's of course, your last point is absolutely critical uh, right now. Um, I have the honor to, uh, to invite uh, Minister Lee, Lee White, who is the Minister for Forest, Sea, the Environment and Climate Plan um, in Gabon. Um, Minister, of course, it goes without saying that the challenges facing African countries um, in the face of climate change are only going to be exacerbated by the ongoing global pandemic. So maybe you can speak a little bit about what Africa's outlook is on achieving a sustainable recovery and how you see the role of using policies and measures such as carbon pricing. Um, and if so, how can we make carbon pricing work for African economies? So over to you, Minister White. I'll, I'll give you a sort of a forested Africa perspective. Uh, Gabon is on the equator, a rainforest country, 88% forested. And I think we see in this COVID outbreak, we, we see the, the, the risk of, of degrading nature. We're, we're hearing a lot of people talking about how we need a new relationship with nature and and how nature-based solutions for climate change and nature-based solutions for maintaining um, human health, whether it's you know, bringing nature into cities to in improve human health in cities or, or um, minimizing the, the percentages, of, you know, the chances of our rich biodiversity of coronaviruses in all of the wildlife that we have in Gabon. Um, and that many people eat, um, jumping to, to human populations. I think if, if we look at what's coming our way in terms of climate change, if we don't make significant changes, we see the deforestation rate in DRC up to almost 2% per year. And there's pretty good data now that shows that if you lose the rainforest of Eastern DRC, you lose the rainfall in the Ethiopian highlands. And so you lose three quarters of the Nile. And so you have 100 million Egyptians who can't feed themselves anymore because they don't have the annual Nile flood. Um, and that's something that is, is still maybe thought of as science fiction, but, but it, it's something that's becoming reality. It's, it's something that we can now imagine happening in 30 years time and, and 30 years is is a, a very short amount of amount of time so we we desperately need to accelerate action we desperately need the glasgow cop to be a success to increase ambition now in gabon our government over decades now has has been taking climate change seriously. We've, we've developed a national low carbon development strategy that, that has been then integrated across different sectors. Um, on the basis of that, we were able to sign last year at the UN uh, an agreement with Norway through the CAFI program um, to do Africa's first um, results-based um, carbon payment, so um, $150 million worth of, of, of results-based carbon, and we managed to push the price of rainforest carbon to $10 a ton um, with that agreement. I, I feel a bit like a salesman. Um, 
my carbon, my rainforest carbon that comes with biodiversity, it comes with gorillas and elephants and, and generates rainfall for the Sahel and so on and so forth, feels to me that my carbon should be worth more than carbon being sucked out of a, uh, a coal-fired um, plant in, in Europe. But the reality tends to be the opposite. Rainforest carbon is classically valued at $5 a tonne. And even though 10 years ago, McKinsey and their cost curve were showing that we have to get the price of carbon up to $25, $30 if we want to make a difference. Despite that, 10 years on, we're still talking about rainforest carbon being worth $5. And as Minister of Forestry, I'm thinking, okay, well, currently it's $10. Can I, can I influence forest management policies with carbon at $10 a tonne? Can I improve forest management? Can I, can I make sure that the forests will still be there in 20 years? continuing to, 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 to absorb carbon dioxide out of, the, out of the, um, the atmosphere. And I think the, the bottom line is that, that $25, $30 cost curve that McKinsey came up with, I think is really the minimum that we need to be aiming for as, as I think about how I move a forestry sector towards more sustainable activities, how I, I, I move Gabon's um, Kind of industry towards a, a low carbon perspective. And so I think we really do need to, to focus on that, I would say $30 a ton as, as something that the planet needs to adopt um, across the board. And then maybe we will make our work, work, our, work our way up over time. But so uh, that's my pitch. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And, and well, I think you have a very fertile audience here. I think we would all agree that uh, forest carbon um, cannot be priced at five dollars a ton. That, that that's just not realistic. So um, we need to put our heads together. Um, last but not least, we are we are really over time now. I'm sorry, but I don't want to uh, I don't want to miss Helen. We um, I'd like to invite Helen Mountford, who's the vice president for climate change at WRI. Um, Helen, um, please, if you can keep it really short, but I did want to hear your thoughts just on um, how can we implement carbon pricing policies that, that really include fairness as uh, at the top of, uh, of, the, of considerations. So Helen, over to you. Thanks very much, uh, Bernice, and I, and I can certainly keep it short. I'm, I'll build very much on what Ms. Stern already highlighted um, in terms of how carbon pricing can be used both uh, both to actually generate some of the revenues that we need so desperately, which can be used to help uh, ensure that low income and middle income households are at least as well off, if not better, uh, from the carbon pricing, but also to facilitate a just transition. Um, I think one of the things that's particularly relevant at the moment in this uh, COVID-19 period, as countries are looking at how to uh, recover the economy coming out of this pandemic, um, a real challenge right now is around jobs. How do we generate the jobs we need? How do we protect jobs? How would we maintain them? And one of the things that we have seen um, from, from a number of studies is that moving in an accelerated way towards low carbon economy can actually generate net jobs. So I did want to raise this and um, some of the work of the new climate economy, uh, for example, which is co-chaired by uh, Lord Stern, have found that bold climate actions can deliver as much as 65 million new jobs by 2030 compared to business as usual. And with these benefits, with new jobs starting in the very first year. So it's definitely something that should be part of the transition. And that includes both carbon pricing and fossil fuel subsidy reform. But we actually have some good examples on the ground where we're seeing, um, seeing carbon pricing initiatives that are actually delivering both a just transition and and uh, better lives for low and middle income households. So just let me cite three of these very briefly. One is um, British Columbia. Many are familiar with the example, but just to highlight that they've had a carbon tax in place for over a decade. They've recycled the revenues back to households and businesses through other tax cuts. And what they've found is that they've led to a net benefit for low and middle income households. So this was the basis on which Canada wide a carbon tax was rolled out last year, which will actually benefit the vast majority of households, particularly those that are most vulnerable and uh, poor. 
but we've seen similarly in Chile, and it was great to hear from Minister Jogay there about Chile's carbon tax. Their carbon tax was implemented in a way that increases costs for large power companies, but actually lowers the tax burden for individual consumers, so households and consumers are better off. Um, he mentioned the importance of a dialogue and a just transition for affected workers and communities, and that some of the revenues coming from the carbon tax can actually be used to help manage the transition for those affected communities and workers. It's an opportunity to diversify local economies, to retrain workers, to help the transition to a low carbon economy, which is already underway and is inevitable, to ensure that that is a smooth one and the workers and communities are protected. And finally, one other example I wanted to highlight was from California. Um, California has a cap and trade uh, system in place, which has been there for many years, and they use over 50% of the $2 billion um, uh, raised for specific projects um, to benefit disadvantaged communities. So they're targeting some of the revenues from the cap and trade to those communities. So that includes investments in affordable housing, and rooftop solar for vulnerable households, which then lowers uh, their costs, uh, their energy and electricity costs month after month, and for things like zero emission electric buses. So we've got a lot of lessons out there already learned of how we can implement carbon pricing in a way which actually benefits low-income and vulnerable communities and helps to ensure a just transition. We just need to follow that advice and move it forward. And, the CPLC is a fantastic place to actually collect that uh, guidance and, um, and the, the lessons that have been learned and to disseminate those widely. So do count on CPLC for that support. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. And, and thanks. Thank you uh, to all the panelists for this first panel. Um, we, we are running out of time, so sadly we can't take any additional questions, but uh, I'm going to hand it over to Osbeta now of the IFC to uh, to ch chair the second panel. And then I'm hoping that we can obviously keep a lot of this dialogue going um, beyond this particular uh, high level event because interventions are always too short. So, but anyway, thank you. Over to you, uh, Osbeta. Bernice, thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all. Great to see many friends uh, on the screen. So in this second session, uh, we are going to focus on industries. And as, as we all know, the world is facing unprecedented challenges uh, in front of us. And the question is, how do we rebuild global economy in the aftermath? And what is our immediate response to the pandemic? And what is our next step in the response? How do we get more green, more equitable, more sustainable recovery? So this panel will talk about green rebuild and how this can not only deal with the impact of the pandemic, but how is it going to deal with the impact of climate, which we already know about. The world that, as we collectively know it, is unlikely to go to the old normal. So what is this new normal? What is it going to look like? So I'm going to turn to our first speaker, Honorable Lord Parker of Battle PC, Executive Chairman of the Board of Directors of EN Plus Group. Lord Barker, you have signed on to the CEO statement on uniting businesses and governments to recover better, which is a joint call from multinational companies such as uh, the one you chair, to governments asking them to align their recovery with climate science. So the question to you is how can governments and companies ensure that a post-COVID recovery efforts do not sideline long-term climate goals? And what is it that you are going to do about it? Lord Barker. Thank you very much, Alzbeta. Um, it's a real privilege to be joining this very distinguished panel. Um, so hello to everybody right the way around the world. Um, as chairman of the world's largest producer of low carbon aluminium and the biggest producer in the private sector of hydropower, it's a bit of a no-brainer that we would be in favor of a high carbon price. But the fact of the matter is even companies like us um, who are at the forefront of low carbon industry still have got a lot to do to align with science-based targets and get on a net zero trajectory and then achieve that trajectory to, to meet a net zero um, economy. And that's going to take a huge amount of investment. And it sometimes feels like the conversations around 
carbon pricing have been going round and round and round forever. I've been in this um, field for about 20 years. I was in politics in 15 years with a climate change brief. And people hoped for a carbon price, but never really expected one. But I do think now we are at an epoch-making moment as we recover from this terrible pandemic that there is going to be something like a $10 billion public stimulus um, in, into the global economy led by governments around the world. And that means choices are going to have to be made. Priorities are going to be chosen. And without doubt, after this extraordinary, terrible pandemic, civil society, investors, governments, and business are all aligned in trying to reduce the risks to our economy, to our livelihoods, to our world going forward. And we all know that the biggest risk out there post-COVID is climate change. So I do think, I mean, though I, you know, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, I do think there is a real moment now that we've got to grasp. So what does that mean? It doesn't just mean having a green reset and building back better, but we've also got to be really mindful of what we build back with. For example, the materials that we use to create the renewable energy infrastructure or the electric vehicles or the sustainable homes, we've got to make sure we're using here and now low carbon materials. To give one example in my own industry, aluminium. The aluminium that we produce has about two and a half tons of carbon embedded in it. But the global average is about 14, 60% is 16 tons. Yet there's no difference in price whatsoever. And if we're not careful, well-intentioned green recovery or green reset could actually become a great payday for carbon intensive industries around the world unless we have smart, flexible carbon pricing. And so as a result, it's really important that businesses and investors speak up in favor of governments who are advocating this and that we all come together with in, in partnerships, which is why I think this is such an important forum at this uh, moment in time. So that's really, my message is, guys, realize this is a special and unique point in history. It's our time. We've really got to take it. And unless we have a price on carbon, we're going to let this moment pass. And it could, rather than fail to benefit from it, it could actually damage and set back action on climate change. Thank you, Lord Barker. So this is an opportunity to actually do not only a green rebuild while when everything is done, but also a green tilt while we are doing this emergency pandemic response. So we're going to go now to South Africa, and I'm going to call our next uh, guest, Johan Javic, who is the CEO of National Business Initiative in South Africa. We know that carbon pricing can be a key component to uh, managing transition to lower carbon economy. And Lord Barker just called on all of us to actually go and advocate for it. Now, we know from CDP that about 65 percent of South African companies either use carbon pricing or intend to use carbon pricing. So how do you see carbon pricing contributing to driving a just transition in South Africa, not only a green transition in South Africa? Joanne, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Elspeta. Um, could you turn on your camera, please? Okay, sure. Okay, that better. Should be, yeah, there it is. Okay, so um, I think that if we look at what is happening in South Africa at the moment, and particularly uh, what you, you, you're talking about in terms of companies, setting an internal price on carbon, which is most of them, which many of them, 65% uh, of those who respond to CDP do. Um, and also uh, increasingly numbers of companies have linked that to setting science-based targets. Essentially what we find is that they are using it as an internal planning tool on the first hand um, and are using it to measure their competitiveness to assess um, the technologies they use and to in fact set a direction that they would want to go in in terms of being able to produce in a more sustainable way so i think that we've come quite a long way in relation to that but i, I think that that needs to be located within a much broader uh, policy framework 
um, that will enable a real transition and a much faster rate of change on the ground and in the way that industry operates in a country like South Africa. Um, and what we do have um, is the introduction of a carbon tax in our economy that uh, impacts the big emitting companies. But in the context of COVID, that at this point in time has been, its implementation has been uh, delayed, delayed a bit. So I don't think that we've actually seen what the coincidence of policy on the one hand, a, a carbon pricing policy on the one hand, and what it is that companies internally are doing, what the potential of that is. But I think that in the South African context, what we've seen over the last while is that COVID has amplified a whole set of existing problems around the sustainability of our entire economic system, inequality, unemployment, um, our emissions profile are all seriously unacceptable. And more and more companies are starting to see um, renewable energy, uh, climate friendly technologies as the way forward and also as the way to generate employment and as an essential agreement in in essential ingredient of what a green stimulus might involve. I think that what we're going to need to do is to bring private and public together around that to give it real traction and make it move. Thank you very much, Joanne. So really the prescription is to work together between the public and private sector to make it happen. So we're yeah. going to now switch gears a little bit and we are going to our next esteemed panelist, uh, Sui Chen Do who is the president of Global Compact Network in Singapore, but even more importantly, she's a member of the board of Singapore Airlines and Capital Land. So, uh, Sui, you've got experience in hard to abate emissions industries. So how can we bring companies with such a profile into the fold, and particularly in those industries that do not yet have clear pathways to decarbonization? but can be key to economic revival and can be key to economic stability. And the most important, we can be key to growth, especially in emerging markets. So Sui, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. And uh, I, I just uh, want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to say something about this uh, important topic, especially uh, in my part of the world where the level of awareness, uh, it's now uh, starting to get on an accelerated path. And we all know, and, and the discussion throughout the whole night has been that COVID-19 has disrupted uh, many business sectors, and there is broader recognition that climate change uh, will actually result in more lasting damage uh, than COVID-19. Uh, and, and we know that the crisis will come to pass, but climate change, uh, climate challenges will, will persist. And, and for this reason, uh, investors are already acting to realize the longer term benefit of uh, decarbonization. And we've seen it in the record level of uh, investment. So in the last first four months of this year, the 12.2 billion of investment and funds that has been poured into ESG uh, practices is just an uh, indication of uh, the emphasis. Um, and, and this um, widespread lockdowns and the closure of borders, the restriction in international travels and the literal shutdown of the economy are expected to reduce uh, global CO2 uh, emissions. And in IEA's report, um, this is expected to go down by 8% in uh, 2019, uh, uh, in 2020 versus 2019. Uh, and, and this is uh, unusual times and businesses and societies alike, we know that decarbonization with such draconian, draconian measures uh, just simply cannot be realistic. Uh, so the path to achieving well below two degrees um, must be accelerated. Uh, we all sign on to that, but this path must be done with an orderly transition. And uh, Nigel Topping mentioned mentioned it earlier, and and he said this emission needs to this transition needs to come with some clarity. When will coal be phased out? When could fossil fuel could ever potentially be phased out? What's the floor price on emissions? So these are all very key questions. 
Now back to the boards. Um, uh, in this part of the world and where I'm from, Singapore, uh, the level of knowledge uh, varies uh, from board to board. Uh, some boards have been looking at the issue of emissions for a really long time. For some, uh, this is a nascent topic. Uh, and this panel is uh, extremely sophisticated and you've been discussing this topic for a while, uh, but let me take it to, to some boards uh, where this may not be a, 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 a old topic or a sophisticated topic. Uh, and, and as a start, um, at the board level, sustainability discussion uh, must be taken at the board and it must be broadened beyond environment. And we all recognize that COVID-19 has laid bare that uh, it is not just the environment, but it's social justice issues, uh, health issues that all we, we all have to be concerned about. Uh, so boards need to ex address this full extent of the ESP, the ESG scope. Uh, so it's green and it's healthy. And, and understanding the full extent of the corporation's emissions, whether it's direct or indirect, I think it's the first uh, part. It's the first step to take uh, in one of the boards that I'm in, uh, it is meticulously going back and doing an inventory of these emissions. Uh, and, and then it's looking at science-based targets and say, what realistically can we achieve 10 years from now? What would the challenge be? Uh, taking pricing price on carbon, and we've we've uh, discussed at length um, the the you know the range of carbon price that exists today. What is that right carbon price to use um, that would still be realistic uh, to achieve uh, the two degree world or the well under two degree world? Uh, at the same time, give us that ability to continue to invest and invest in the right thing. Uh, there's one thing about, you know, we talked about, um, I think it's Lord Barker who talked about low carbon uh, aluminium. And I, I, I heard that uh, the London Metal Exchange will launch a trading platform on, on uh, low, low carbon uh, aluminium. Now, this will test customers and consumers' willingness to pay a premium. Uh, and, and, and we've seen quite uh, mixed uh, responses from consumers. Uh, from willingness to pay, uh, and and some are not. So so at times the walk do not um, are not consistent with with the action. Mm -hmm. I want to close with uh, COVID nineteen has created a, a economic crisis. It's an opportunity for businesses to e reevaluate their investment and their operational strategy. And it could Indeed. be that that these unintended consequence of the pandemic will galvanize companies and governments to respond and to bring about long-term positive effects. Thank you. That is great to hear, Sri. Uh, I think it, every 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 uh, issue such as the pandemic brings in opportunities and great to hear the, the elaboration on the role of uh, company boards and education of the boards in moving the issue forward. So let us now move to our next uh, speaker, Peter Backer. Peter, great to see you. Peter is the CEO of World Business Council for Sustainable Development. So, Peter, a number of your companies in your um, organization have announced recently that they would like to become carbon neutral, net zero, and made a number of other commitments. And they made these commitments in the middle of the pandemic when their business models, as Sweet just mentioned, is being rethought, reconsidered, uh, changed perhaps. So, what are your thoughts on moving from announceables to actual action so it doesn't stay with the announcement but it, it becomes a reality peter over to you uh, thank you uh, very much uh, great to be on um you're right you know business has woken up to climate change this of course started way before COVID. but if anything i hear and pick up that sustainability is becoming more important not less important to all companies what COVID has done is that it has exposed the vulnerabilities in their business models, in their supply chains, and everybody is now grappling with how to become more resilient. We're also asking ourselves what will be the structural changes that COVID will bring in the way we work, we travel, we produce things. And we all realize that um, nature is the strongest force we have. And you know, we may get through COVID, but uh, if climate hits, the uh, shock will be much bigger than even COVID has ever been. 
So what we now see very broad based is companies are endorsing uh, science based targets. That means in climate are all signing up to one and a half degree pledges, uh, decarbonizing by no later than 2050. Uh, in this panel, uh, I think we all agree that carbon pricing is the most effective tool to accelerate the decarbonization. But I would say in the context of COVID, you now see two conversations emerge. One is we must make our systems more resilient. Second, we must create more jobs. And again, carbon pricing helps with that. It will incentivize investments in alternative uh, fuels, low carbon fuels. And it's becoming clear a dollar invested in the fossil fuel versus a dollar invested in low carbon fuels has about the ratio of six to seven jobs created more in the low carbon world than in the fossil fuel world. So also for jobs, decarbonization and carbon pricing is actually what is uh, what is important. I see broad based three reasons why companies get involved in decarbonization and therefore support carbon pricing. First one is, as I said, we need to improve the resilience in supply chains. Decarbonization will de-risk your supply chains and therefore make you more resilient to those shocks. The second thing we see is we see a race to the top emerge. Um, early on, people were signing up to decarbonize by 2050. You now see companies come out with statements to do it in 2040. We've even seen the first ones at 2039. So a race to the top, which means you need to accelerate the investments in a decarbonized system. And again, carbon pricing can help. The last thing I would say, though, is we, we must not only talk about carbon price. We must talk about carbon price in relation to better transparency. So make TCFD mandatory, put a high price on carbon, and then you'll really see a focus to accelerate investments by business, but also a reward in the capital markets that will give further incentives to start the race to the top. So that, that to me would be the combination. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. I think this is a, a great combination and I'm going to pick up on your first comment, which is on jobs and turn it on to our next speaker and Horia Simonson, who is a senior director of the Confederation of Danish Industry. So, and um, how are companies planning to effectively balance people, profits and planet? So labor that Peter was just talking about and the bottom line and resilience and managing of the emissions. How do you see that in the context of your federation? Thank you very much for a very fine arrangement and discussion until now. Well, the Confederation of Danish Industry is uh, the largest business organization in Denmark. Um, for more than 18,000 companies and more than half a million uh, employees. And uh, as you all know, probably Denmark is a very small open economy. We're only 5.5 million people. And our trademark is trade, exports and green solutions. More than 12% of our exports are energy technology in Denmark. So of course, Denmark, but also the Confederation of Danish Industries support the Paris Agreement the European Green Deal, and work together to combat climate change and acknowledge that it requires international cooperation. We have very high ambitions in Denmark. Uh, only uh, last night, there was a new climate uh, agreement uh, in the Danish parliament, suggesting new initiatives uh, to actually curb climate change, but also to kickstart the economy after the COVID-19 crisis or in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis. And a lot of those initiatives, you would uh, be able to guess immediately what it is like, offshore wind turbines, energy efficiency, and so on. But also the, the majority in the Danish parliament agreed actually to debate a Danish CO2 tax in the autumn. And this is uh, generally something that we are not too fond about because we think that the EU ETS system, the carbon trading system, is uh, sufficient. But now when, uh, now when it's agreed that we have to look into it in Denmark, we will of course prepare in the Confederation of Danish Industries and see how can that be um, balanced for the industry side. So, so, so it's uh, a matter of actually solving the climate crisis and the 
COVID-19 consequences in a, in, in, in a balanced way that is profit, profitable for both. So, the link to the international carbon pricing in the EU ETS or a global uh, carbon pricing is very important seen from our side, but now we will have to, to look into a Danish solution, but we will support very much efforts to look into uh, global or cross-national solutions also. A very green, but still a bit worried about how a national uh, pricing of carbon dioxide can influence the possibility for CO2 leakage, uh, growth, uh, employment, and so on in Denmark. But that would be your concerns too, I think. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And this was great to hear. So now we're going to go to our last speaker uh, who will move us from uh, developed economies from Denmark and a few other places that we talk about to, uh, to India. Vikram Srikant Kirloskar is an immediate past president of the Confederation of Indian Industries. And um, he will uh, talk to us about how industry associations can ensure that green recovery is not only for large companies, but can also help medium and small size enterprises. And Vikram, if you get a chance also, please talk to us about what companies in emerging markets except, expect from governments uh, so that their recovery can be strong and green. Vikram, the floor is yours. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, you know, one of the effects of, of the whole COVID pandemic has been a, a huge shutdown across India. And after a long time in Bangalore at home, you know, for, for two, three months, we've seen clear blue skies, lots of birds in my garden, no smell, no sound. It's a, it's a complete new experience for me and my family. And I think not only for me and my family, for everyone around us. And I think my hope is that that memory remains in our brain. And that's how we expect the world to be to be as we go ahead. I think that's, that's, that's a very important aspect, I think, uh, as we go ahead. I'd like to talk uh, a little bit on maybe two things. One is experience through CII, what we are doing through CII, as well as what uh, I've done in my own uh, businesses and uh, companies. First thing on carbon price or, or carbon pricing. I, I don't, I think it's still a little bit ahead of time for for India, uh, I've talked about carbon taxation at home, saying that you know inefficient uh, devices, cars, etc., which have more carbon emissions should be taxed higher, and those with uh, a lower emission, whether it's an air conditioner, or refrigerator, or whatever, that basically look at carbon taxation. We've we've talked about it. The concept is is great. Uh, how do you implement it? How do you actually measure it and how do you implement it is a big question. But that's that's one way. It's it's very clear in, in India, uh, uh, our energy requirements are going to keep on, keep on growing. They're growing in a huge way as our economy grows. And uh, getting out of carbon, getting out of coal-fired plants in the long run uh, is not going to be that easy for us. We have one of the world's fastest uh, uh, adders of renewable and solar energy, but still carbon is going to be a main player as we go along. And the only thing is, uh, we hope there'll be cleaner power plants as we go along, as we add to the add to the grid. Uh, let, let, let me tell you a little bit on my uh, own business, uh, on, on the car business, which is in partnership with Toyota. Many years ago, Toyota took a, a challenge, as many companies have done, of zero carbon emissions, whether it's in, in new vehicles or life cycle of the manufacturing. We've also talked about optimizing water resources, which is a huge problem in the country, recycling economy, recycling based society, as well as a society in harmony with nature. So we've been working on this very seriously. And the way we found that this can be effective in our business was really from a behavior change. It's, it's, you can talk of technology, you can talk of, uh, of, of many things. I need investment, I need technology, et cetera. But what you really need is a behavioral change. And, and the way we started implementing this about five, six years ago was by teaching all our team members what is the effect of carbon on their life and on their future, on their children. 
And that is what brought about a major change in the way we, we did our business. Now we are running our car factory with more than 95% I think solar and renewables. We use zero fresh water, zero emissions on anything. And all this has come out of individual innovation. So Hardly become, the key to change is this behavioral this approach behavior change. and yes. innovation. So first, first, individually, if you feel, yes, I want a clean area around me. Yeah, okay. that comes from will, that desire of, of my crash. I will take care of. I don't want someone else to take care of my crash. So that's excellent. In the car industry, we can go to. Uh, we've gone to zero car. Uh, we've, we we measure our carbon uh, virtually every day. All our emissions. We've gone to zero VOCs, uh, zero liquid emissions, and stuff like that. Uh, plant enough trees, and you know, make sure counter. Same thing is happening on products with hybrids and hydrogen. And uh, as we go ahead. Uh, that is great to hear, uh, Vikram. So behavioral change for us is is very very important. The key. Thank you, well, Vikram. I... We'll have to wrap up uh, okay. because I think we are running out of time. Uh, but thank you for that insight into how it starts with the individual approach to it, and that that sort of manifests itself in how you run your business and then how you run the Confederation of Industries. So we'll have to wrap up. Uh, so just to close this session, I'm taking four points out of this. We heard from uh, several speakers that uh, transition is going to give us more jobs, not less jobs. Uh, we heard from a couple of speakers that we are going to achieve resilience in supply chains, which is critical, as we have found out during this pandemic. And in order to make it happen, we heard from several speakers the very strong call for carbon pricing uh, because it will speed up the transition. And in order to get rewarded for that, we have heard a call for better transparency and TCFD reporting, because that's why investors are going to see what you're actually doing and you get rewarded for that. So we're gonna close this session now and I'm going to ask uh, my colleague, Hans-Peter Lankes, Vice President, Economics and Private Sector Development at the IFC to uh, give us closing remarks of this high level uh, CPLC session. Hans-Peter. Thank you very much, Alzbeta, and, and thanks all for a great session. I'll be very brief. Like many have emphasized today, climate change has not taken a break and neither can climate action. So rebuilding after COVID needs to take climate impacts into account. And I'm with Vikram. COVID has shown that human behavior is adaptive. If people can learn to change their ways in response to the virus, why not do what is needed for climate change? We know that carbon pricing can be a hugely effective tool for behavior change. It supports decision-making aligned with fundamentals. It can be used to support a fair and just transition, as Nick Stern reminded us. And despite what the detractors are saying, it has long been the preferred choice for companies to manage such risks. They're calling for clarity. Governments should deliver. And look, governments have been capable of vision and disruptive decisions when it was needed during COVID-19. We're seeing the private sector step up, even where it might be least expected, like Nigel Topping mentioned the EP announcement just last week that they will price carbon at $100 in 2030 is a huge shift. The recognition that some assets are stranded will cause a write-off of about $17.5 billion for the company. And similarly, movements such as the Race to Zero campaign have got almost 1,000 businesses to sign on to their zero emission objective. Now, what can we at the World Bank Group do to complement these efforts? You have heard Mario Pangestu at the opening. And specifically for IFC, we're working on a post-COVID reconstructing, restructuring and recovery program that will throughout aim to reshape economies to be more equitable, resilient and green. And we're applying Stern Stiglitz carbon pricing to medium and high emission projects. And uh, hopefully we'll soon have a broader approach in place on stranding. It would be great if we could work with lots of BPs to articulate carbon reality as it is and to counter fossil illusions. Now, collaboration across sectors and different kinds of actors will be key, and groups such as the CPLC are integral to building momentum to make this happen. Thank you for your leadership. And now back to Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Thank you, Asbeta. So this was the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition High-Level Dialogue, realizing the full potential of carbon pricing in a sustainable recovery as part of kickstarting a sustainable recovery series in partnership with Innovate for Climate. This is the end for today. Thank you for joining us.